Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is, and this is going to be a long introduction because he is a magnificent person who has lots of titles to his name. Uh, so a seven-time cabaret dance champion, finalist on America's Got Talent, director of social emotional learning at Middle School 88 in Brooklyn, a teacher in New York City since 1993, a life coach, a uh, classroom trainer, and if that wasn't enough, an author. But we're not here to talk about any of those first few. We're here to talk about him being an author. David Paris is our guest today. He is the author of A COVID Story. David, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to share my story. Um, David, uh, I usually start off all my interviews with my authors the same way. Where did you get your sense to write? Yeah, I always wanted to, from the time I was very young, uh, when I was in middle school, I wrote a story that TV was a communist plot. And I, <laughs> and I said, the school newspaper, yeah, and uh, I, I, I've always been interested in having insightful ideas about the world and sharing them with as many uh, people as possible. In, uh, in in high school, I kind of, yeah, just sharing you, I'm way <laughs> off base, man. Like I, from the earliest ages, you know, <laughs> I just, I just like how you, the first thing that comes out of your mouth is TV is a communist plot. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. I, I've been uh, on the left wing of, of politics and, and society for a long, for a long time. I went to a hippie college, went to even a crazier uh, graduate school for uh, my graduate degree in teaching. But yeah, I've always interested in, if I find something insightful, I want to share it with people. Um, I'm not gifted with, um, being verbose and I don't I try to actually find the fewest words possible I'm a middle school teacher if I speak for a moment too long the class is gone <laughs> you know and if the class is gone you're gonna suffer all year so I've been trained over 30 years of work with middle school students you better be insightful and concise and that's the way I try to write and if I if it's interesting if it's humorous if it's uh if you're offering something different as a writer or as a teacher I know I have my audience so how what was how how did that get nurtured as a child? Was it something that your parents uh, thrust upon you to say, "Hey, continue writing if you like writing," or was it something that you just picked up naturally? Yeah, I was never nurtured to write. I was just nurtured to be a, a wild kid. My <laughs> sister walked. <laughs> this is a true story. I uh, she 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 cut my hair in a punk haircut, gave me two. Um, earrings in, a t in the mid 80s at a time where if you had that you were dead you were uh, the moment you, and, and I was targeted all the time but I was at the very early age I was taught you better be different because life is boring and you need to be excited <laughs> you know so that was nurtured um, and writing only became an extension of that of how can I share these potential outlandish ideas or interesting ideas um, I don't you know, I, it's funny, I just looked back at my college portfolio the other day as I was, I was cleaning, and I used to just write, I, I could say that my writing back then was all about religion, and it was really bad writing. My, my professor at, at, the, at the hippie school said my writing got worse as my education progressed, and 30 years later, I was like, you know what, he's right. <laughs> so I, looked at, I looked at all that work, it was really bad, but it was because I was just interested in sharing my ideas, and be, then I became an English teacher for the most part for 30 years with kids. And as I helped them hone their ideas, what I didn't know at the same time is I started being able to figure out how to write for an audience. And it wasn't something I ever really pursued um, other than just my own for my own joy until five years ago when um, I was pushing my students to on the New Year's resolution to do something that I said, you know what, if you're going to do something new, I'm going to do something new. And I said, I'm going to write a book. And I've been telling stories for kids about, you know, if there was a, a siren or something broke down, I'd make up a ghost story about how that happened. And they're like intrigued. I'm like, man, maybe I could do this. And that became the the impetus for writing my first book, Laughable Legends, um, which is a bunch of short stories, uh, humorous la uh, adolescent fiction that has a life lesson that's very, very edgy. The first book, first story is called uh, Eighth Grade Will Be the Best Three Years of Your Life. You know, and when you hear that, you know, they're like three years, wait a second, how'd that happen? And, you know, so I'm trying to, <laughs> and, and um, that got me started into writing. And then um, once I tasted that and I saw, hey, I'm doing this pretty well, 
it just became a different joy. Now, you know, I'm an acrobatic dancer, I'm getting a little bit older. And as I, uh, I've had a lot of success, but I still can't do what I used to be able to do. And I've been searching for what is it for me to be happy? Writing is now fine, is, is, is that medium for me. Well, and that's where this this interview starts off. Well, it doesn't start off, but it continues on. Um, your most recent book, A COVID Story. This is, uh, and I'll get you to uh, talk a little bit about how this came about, but this is a story about you. This is the first time writing because I've uh, looked at your other books that you've released and you've written about other people. This is the first time writing about yourself. What was the challenge in that, in writing about yourself in this horrendous situation that you found yourself in? Yeah, I found it, it was painful. The, cha- the biggest challenge, it was, it was like people, when they read the book, they say, my God, that was so cathartic. You clearly released so much. And I said, no, man, every time I shared the pain of what I went through, I relived it <laughs> every, and then I had to revise it. It was horribly painful. So the challenge uh, for me was never artistically, um, it was never artistic or, or effort. It was simply, how do I deal with the pain? Because when you're experiencing trauma, um, some of the worst thing you can do is just uh, repeat it without processing it. So um, you, you should, it, there's titration is the big word. You, you want to yeah. do it slowly, right? So um, yeah, man, that wasn't easy, but I knew it was a mission. I knew that I could tell the story. So many people are, uh, don't know anybody who was affected by COVID. And I was like, I want to share my story um, so that more people can know what it's like or for those people who did experience this, like, yeah, this guy, he knows what happened to me. I'm not alone. So I was on a mission. And to be honest with you, that was the challenge. But the upside is when I was experiencing heavy, heavy uh, anxiety and, 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 and depression with, um, after, after my experience, um, not just because of what physically was there, but m- what my body went through. And the single most thing that helped me the most was writing every day. <laughs> it's like, even from the moment I was able to start writing, um, even if it was for five minutes, having a mission and a purpose in life after you experience a near death, um, for those people who don't know, I was in a coma for 32 days and I was in the hospital for three months. It was really those 32 days. When you wake up, having near death in front of your life makes you relook at everything. It's very cliche. And so I won't repeat what that's like, but I will say it can also be a lot of people experience immense, especially there's a love and a happiness you receive when you uh, have this ease. And when you come out of that coma, it's not easy to come back. And some of the nicest things were people welcoming me back. But I was just like, what? I, something inside of me, whether you touch God or you just touch the drugs that they put you under. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure which one it was. But something <laughs> told me, hey, look, it's not going to be easy when you get up. Writing made it much easier. So like you said, um, you were put into a medically induced coma uh, for 32 days. You were in the hospital for just over 85 days, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong here. 88 days. Um, And this was at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, So the World Health Organization announces that it is an official pandemic on March 13th. You start seeing signs of potential COVID-19 in early, like literally April 3rd, you get told you need to go see a doctor because in New York at that time, the governor had said, if you have mild symptoms, stay away from the hospital. But, (laughs) and you doing your due diligence did. It wasn't until a family member said, no, you need to go see a doctor to go actually check out if you're okay. Had you known anyone prior to your potential going in and saying, I'm diagnosed with COVID, that had been diagnosed? Yeah, nobody. We didn't have testing back then. So um, the testing w- was late and uh, not available. So back then, not, I didn't know somebody. And if you had a few million dollars, I think th- those people were getting tested. But short, short of that kind of uh, money tree, yeah, that wasn't happening. So yeah, and in fact, I actually I had mild symptoms. I was sicker than I've ever been, but I didn't have the uh, short of breath. And there was a list of things. I was like, well, it's not that extreme. And it was actually the eighth day where I fell asleep in front of my refrigerator uh, as I was getting breakfast because I just got so tired. I woke up and realized, oh, I am short of breath. <laughs> 
And then when my family told me, yo, you need to go to the hospital, I was like, uh, I was trying to say no, but because I couldn't speak because I was short of breath, they said, oh yeah, that is time to go to the hospital. So it was an interesting time because, um, you know, I, I look back and a lot of things we didn't, we, we just didn't know. And you, you tell the story in a way, like the first few chapters of just even getting to the hospital and getting into the hospital, you tell a story that is, and I, I, par I pardon my French here, but it scared the crap out of me because from someone who had COVID, I was diagnosed with COVID, but not at an extreme case like yourself. I don't know what people went through, but when you read your story, you're saying you are going into the hospital, you are seeing other people in this situation, you're seeing people worse off than you. Yeah. How do you grapple with the situation of going into a hospital where this, we don't know what the uh, vaccine is. We do not know if there's going to be a vaccine. Deaths are piling up. Talk me through that initial moment of getting into the hospital and the doctor saying to you, okay, we have to admit you. Yeah, I'm going to say some weird things here. I love it. <laughs> love <yourself>. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Uh, for me, I was so confident being 48 and, and, and having good heart rate that I was not going to die. At, at the moment, it wasn't belief in God. It was just a belief in statistics. And they said, hey, look, this is an old person's uh, age, or if you have a comorbidity, maybe, maybe that you might be in trouble. So even though I couldn't breathe, <laughs> and let me tell you, like the, the joke I make is when I walked in, you know, I always want to have to steal, but they said I had lungs of cement. You know, they, they, they were like, you're in bad shape. And I couldn't breathe. And I didn't even know how bad it was until I finally got to the lobby and actually, there, I couldn't even tell. They asked me my name. I couldn't say it. Within seconds, they put a wheelchair underneath an oxygen tank. But when I got my first die, the first thing was relief. So the moment I got oxygen, I was like, oh, I haven't been able to breathe for a week. <laughs> I just didn't know. Um, and apparently, my oxygen level is at 70%. When it goes below 90, you're in trouble. So I was <laughs> right. <laughs> just and, a tad. And, it's just that, and you know, I hear, I heard constant stories from the nurses of how many people died in their homes. You know, like I don't know, it's it it, it people in New York City, the hospitals are overwhelmed. They told to stay home. I almost stayed home. If I did, I would have died. Um, but the moment they gave me the, <laughs> it's gonna sound crazy. The moment they gave me my diagnosis, I said, "Great, I'm gonna get a few days off of work." I wasn't worried at that moment. <laughs> No. <laughs> for those who aren't watching this i am shaking my head at the fact that his first thought was hey i'm getting a few days off work i was so excited you know and um i thought you know i'd get the immunity and then and then i'd be fine i really wasn't worried um i do know the next four or five days were hallucination induced experiences like i remember uh, horrible things happening around me and um Many people will say the hallucinations associated with uh, when you're in, in, a, in, in a bad place is, is really tough. Um, I can't say I was worried though at the time. Like the moment they put me in intubation, I remember the doctor telling me, I was like, great, just get me chicken sausage for, for, for when I wake up. And that level of confidence maybe saved me in some way because people who enter that state of fear, it affects how they, they recover. I was fully confident I was coming out. Which, which you have to be if you're going into this situation. I think there's a lot of people who take a diagnosis like this and just become defeated. But you, you on the other hand, don't. You, you, you talk about it in your book and you, are, you say, hey, we're, I'm going to get through this, not knowing the worst is yet to come. I didn't know the worst was going to get worse to come. And it's interesting. I always think about people who say believe in themselves. And, you know, it's funny. I believe in myself a lot, so much so that I believed I was a great Latin dancer until I saw myself in video. And I said, oh my God, I look horrible. So like, <laughs> there's this, uh, there's this thing, like, usually it's good to believe in yourself completely, but there is a healthy skepticism inside. And I still kind of work, I'm working that out, but there is a great value in, in, in belief. Um, I actually didn't know I was going to die until my until I was intubated. People often ask me, um, "If you remember what happened?" It's like, yeah, I was dreaming the whole time. And the dream, the earliest dream I remember was uh, that very moment I, I experienced um, with my my maker. I was like, "Oh, I'm going to the other side." I was in a theater with a Japanese uh, character, looked like a Buddha, and I was like, "Oh shit!" I realized I'm I'm dead. 
And I was like, I asked the Buddha, can you, um, am I dying? Is this really it? And the Buddha couldn't respond, but actually just painted a white crescent moon off the side of his face. And that meant to me, oh, that white is, means death. Um, and I spent hours begging him. I was like, please, I, I you know, like, it, it, you know, it's funny, before I died, uh, I did, <laughs> I just trying to say that before that experience, um, my heart did stop uh, a few times and um, I did almost die. But before that moment in, in the year before, I had done a lot of good things. I was an acrobatic dance champion, um, mildly successful uh, teacher, um, had a good life. And I thought, you know what? I, I think I had a good life. Maybe I am done. But when you're faced with death, <laughs> you know, that's like, I was like, forget it, God. Forget everything I said. <laughs> no. I, I still have things to do. <laughs> I still have things to do. And I remember that terror, that terror and passion for life. Uh, um, I wonder to some degree, having that is what maybe kept me alive. Because I was just like, no, I'm, I, you need to find a way for me to live. And the Buddha would tell me no for the longest. And finally said, yes, I'll give you a chance but it'll be the smallest little sliver of a chance. Um, and you're gonna have to fight harder than you ever have in your life. Whether that's the drugs or a real experience, the spiritual Buddha, I don't know. But uh, I do know that's when I first realized, oh shoot, I might die. And they said like, um, I was the sickest person in the whole hospital of COVID at the time. Um, and many others who were not as sick as me died. So they, they said my, my recovery was, was a bit miraculous. Well, and that's an area that I want to talk about, because in your book, A COVID Story, um, you write about the fact that you thank the people of New York. Yeah. You thank the people for flattening the curve. Now, during the pandemic, during the first few months of the pandemic, and I think during this time that you're there, New York was a ground zero. And I hate to use that word because everything that's happened with uh, New York but it was ground zero for the COVID-19 outbreak in the United States. But you thank them. You thank them for doing their job because you, you so eloquently put it that you were 16 out of 17 people. And I want you to talk about that 16 out of 17, because I think there's not a lot of people who understand that at the beginning of this, there was not a lot of resources for people in your situation. Yeah, I wonder how the how the history of this is going to go over, and, and ideally, my story will remind people that when we flatten the curve, you know, a lot of people who were not affected by COVID actually were, were upset about what's happening. I wouldn't be here without that flattening of the curve. Um, when I went to the hospital, the the ventilator was not enough. They have a machine called an ECMO machine. There were only seventeen of them, and I was the sixteenth of the seventeenth patient. If uh, the I would not have had access to that ECMO machine, and I wouldn't be here. Um, otherwise. So when I think about uh, my thanks, I think um, my, it was the New Yorkers who, who decided to, you know, that we shut down and so many people, a lot of people died horrifically, but also people were saved um, because of the measures that were taken. And I'm just immensely grateful for that. You, you are not the only person in this story. You, you talk about your family, you talk about your doctors, you talk about friends in this, in, in a COVID story in the book. When writing this book, was it hard for them to relive this story? Because it's hard for you to really relive this story, but to then talk to family members to say, hey, remember when I was in the hospital? I'm writing a book. I want to tell my story. Can you help? As how was it? it was how, me, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. As hard as it was for me, it was far harder for everybody else. Um, and because my body experienced terror and, and struggle, but my mind didn't. They turned my mind off uh, for, for a month. The horror, I, I asked everybody to be interviewed for the book um, and they hated it. They, they said that we really just wanted to uh, put it past them. The doctors and the nurses felt differently though. The, the nurses loved connecting uh, to me and saying, my, we don't really get to see patients afterwards. And they were just sharing the, the story and the doctors as well. Uh, they were happy and all of them were just overwhelmed um, with having doing double or triple shifts and just seeing so many people pass away. Um, and it, it was rough. So they were happy to uh, contribute to something that might be positive. And the book is formatted that way. The book is not just my, I call it a COVID story, not my COVID story, because I'm trying to include uh, the whole recovery team I had in my life, uh, all the doctors. And I, I interviewed over 30 people to get uh, a wide perspective. It's an oral history. So it's not just uh, my voice. Some people complained they wanted to hear more of my voice, 
that I try to explain to them is really, you don't want to hear too much of me. <laughs> it's like many people have told me <laughs> in little short doses, I'm great. <laughs> little... <laughs> well, you mentioned a good, good point and about the book, it's not written in a traditional book format traditional book format paragraphs, you write it as people talk. You write it in a format that is very engaging, very down to earth, and very easy to understand and follow. What was the reason behind that? Because when some people might read it and go, okay, why did they write it? Why did David write it this way compared to writing it a traditional novel? So what was the reasoning behind the format? Yeah, my thinking is I want it to be as readable as possible. Um, I, I wrote the book like I teach my salsa dance classics, you know, which is that I could talk forever about the basic step, but I just want to condense it into what's important right now um, to be as functional as possible. But to try to condense in general, I try to condense it two or three pages into two or three sentences. Um, and so the book, it, it's subtle in some ways because I'll try to pass some insights or some depth in a humorous, funny way um, but will my intention is it comes from being a salsa dance teacher. It comes from being a middle school teacher, which, and it comes from the own way I'd like to read. I, I struggle with reading, even though I'm an English teacher of 30 years. Um, so <laughs> that's true. And, but the things that I do read well are things that are fast, um, not, and, and, and well, uh, and put together. So a lot, there was a lot of edits, like it's a hundred pages, but it originally was well over 250, uh, maybe even longer. And, I just, any, any line that I felt, I read it a lot to my roommate. And the moment I saw her eyes drift a little bit, I was like, okay, cut that line out, <laughs> you know, like this. So my intention was, uh, you know, keep a few lines of dialogue for each person, keep things moving. And how can I capture the essence of every point um, as interestingly and, and as funny as possible. And you do that. You do that with such a grace and uh, an ability to keep the, like I said, the reader engaged the whole time. I kept on wanting more. I kept on, like you said, I would have read, I would have read the 250 page uh, document if you would have like gave, given it to me. So I, I got to ask the question though, because I think my listeners would want me to ask this question. Yeah. You, you, you talk about in the store, in the book, you 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 lose your ability to write you lose your ability to talk you lose your ability to even text because you look at your text messages sometimes and you go what is this i have no idea what i was trying to say here yeah if i was a listener i would want to ask this i want this a question asked how do you remember this how do you how are you so able to convey what you went through when you were going through it in a way that no one would have been able to like remember all this. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time with myself <laughs> like, and I didn't watch TV, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, uh, it was, it was, yeah. How did, how did I remember all that? Well, I don't remember many of the things from the moment I walked into the hospital to the intubation, like, and the only, most of the memories that are in the book from there are like, I looked at the text messages and like, oh yeah, I wrote that. Or I remember the chicken sausage thing because I saw a menu one day. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. I was thinking about the chicken sausage. So those memories, because they give you the drug to forget, um, it's very hard to recall that time period. Um, and just virtually any detail I could put in there. I know people want details of what it's like to have that experience. So then I, I, I would figure out a way to, to put it in. When I came out though, even though I actually mentally could not take uh, the TV, I could not take uh, my family or phone, all I just needed was my own space. I was in such a sh place of shock. But in that place of shock, um, I was still, <laughs> it's gonna sound crazy, we're in this world right now. When you come out, I spent a month in that other world. And when you spend a month in that other world, you don't just snap into this world. It's a slow transition. So I actually believed, you know, when you have a dream that you remember even a year later, you're like, remember that dream? I've had a thousand of those. <laughs> so like, you know, and now I'm not kidding. And so like when I woke up um, that week or two as I was transitioning to the world, I was still trying to make sense of the last month I had just spent in a dream world trying to figure out my life issues. Does that it? It does make sense. And I'm gl very glad that you put it that way because it, it, it transitions into, into this, um, that awakening, 
that moment when you come about, you are taken off the, uh, you are removed from the medically induced coma and that transition to the road to recovery. You write, you, you write about your struggles with that road to recovery, about learning, over th- learning things over and over again. Yet again, you are one of the few people if the, in the world who can talk about this. How did you come through? Because a lot of people would have given up. And you eloquently start the book with a proverb about uh, uh, two wolves. And I think the moment I started reading about your recovery, I started to re- look at your life in that two wolf scenario. So how did you do it? How did you do it? And if you can talk about the two wolf scenario, because I don't think many people, I didn't know about it until I read your book. So talk about that and then talk about your road to recovery and deciding to do it. Yeah, I'm going to do the two wolves first and then I'm going to forget what you just asked me. If you remind okay, me. I will do that. That's the way the journalist works. <laughs> Fantastic. The, um, for the first month, I was actually so excited to live. I actually did not know I was out for a month. I thought I was out just for a few days. Um, and had to be convinced that I was uh, gone for a month when they showed me the calendar. And to show you where my mind was at, I was more interested in who the Jets picked for their 11th pick in the draft, you know, than I really was. It's like, it's like, it's a weird thing. You wake up and you're not, you don't experience what the rest of the world experience. And I'm going to stop you there for a second. I'm going to say you just lost every Canadian listener because you did not say the New York Islanders because we're more hockey. So, but anyway, uh, continue. I, I have, I'm sorry, Canada. It's the equivalent of, of a new forward, you know, that they're, they're drafting right for the, the Winnipeg there, Jets, right? There you go. <laughs> yeah, di- different Jets. Uh, but if the, the, the theory is the same. And they give you the drugs that make you transition um, without it being too overwhelming. So... I could say the, the first month of recovery, I was just so enamored of the love I was getting from the, the doctors and the nurses and the aides. Um, I was experiencing shock and being alive and being appreciative. They kept saying it was a miracle. And that month was amazing for me. It wasn't, it wasn't hard. What was hard is, after, and even my dance partner, um, I was telling her, look, I'm gonna be great in a month. We're gonna go on a world tour. This is what I really wanna do in life. And so I was super positive. And then I remember when I went to rehab, I was like, you know, this rehab's going a little slower. I might not be ready. I, after a month, I could barely stand. I definitely couldn't walk. Um, and I had no strength to open up a jar or to even lift my left arm more than an inch from my, numerous nerve damage. And all the time I was like, oh, this is actually gonna take a while. And I had this horrible thought and I knew I was positive in that moment. People kept saying, God, he's so positive. Um, and then all of a sudden, it was almost, I felt it. It was on the left side. It's like, wow, if I have this thought, I know it's going to be trouble, but whatever, I'm going to have it. And the thought was, maybe I'm not so lucky. Maybe I'm actually unlucky. My brother got sick. It was probably who I got it from. He had COVID. He was sick for a week. Uh, and then he was fine. Um, all across the world, why is it New York City uh, that, that gets it? And why me? And in that moment, I went from experiencing my uh, recovery as something miraculous to um, immensely unfortunate. And I went from happy to deeply depressed, not for just a day, but for a whole week. And that whole week, people kept walking in and saying, my God, what happened to you? And really what happened to me is the thought. <laughs> it was nothing different other than the shift of perspectives. And that's when I remembered, you know, there's this Native American story. It's a very uh, famous folktale about a, 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 an elder who talks to his grandson Um, about what's inside of us. And inside of us, he says, there are two wolves, always clamoring for our attention. One is a loving wolf, very kind, very warm. Um, And the other one's very jealous, uh, very angry. Um, And the young, the grandson asked, well, um, which which wolf is gonna win? Because they're both battling for your attention. And the the elder says, the one you feed. And I'll tell you, I never understood that story in my life. (laughs) You know, I've read it a few times and I was like, and at that moment I felt depressed. I was like, you know, I finally get that story. We're choosing what perspective we're epistemologically. Um, we think what we think is the way the world is. Once we break out of that pattern that we, our thoughts match what the world is, um, we can ha- actually have control over our thoughts and choose our perspectives that empower us, not disempower us. And one year later, I still live by that every single day what thoughts am I having that are, is this 
thoughts empower me or disempowering. And I'm not going to get tricked anymore that my thoughts is a real reflection of reality. Now to get out of that, it's tricky because you also want to, you know, if, if an angry wolf is feeding, is, is clamoring for your attention, that means you need to cry. That means you need to mourn. That means there's something, you don't ignore it, you know, uh, you don't smile, oh, I'm fine, fuck that, <laughs> you know, no way. You, but you, excuse me, but like, uh, <laughs> but you're like, you, you do acknowledge it, um, see what its value is. And it's like, for me, yeah, I was unlucky. Is that gonna help me uh, in that thought? And I was like, it's really not. Now let me help, let me, let me focus on the things that are there, the people that love me. My dance partner was great, you know, in, in the recovery ones, I couldn't move my body very much. I could just move my arm. And she would say, great, we're gonna do dances just with your arm. And I felt the love she had for, you know, I always worried as an, as an acrobatic dancer, what's gonna happen if I can't move my body? Suddenly I couldn't. Um, and I had to find love in what I could do instead of what I think I should do. And that was my shift from the bad wolf to the good wolf and something I've carried me this whole time. So that was a long answer. <laughs> it, it answers both of the questions uh, that I asked and I'm very happy about that because mental health is one of the things that I think a lot of people are dealing with post pandemic, post COVID-19 mental health is a struggle and it was beforehand, but there is a underlying uh issue around COVID-19 that I think not a lot of people are talking about, but you just talked about it. And I want to jump on it for a little bit here, if that's okay. I'm immensely passionate about this topic. If there's nothing, you know, there are a few things I want to do in the book, but the one is mental health. Like I, I never knew about this world and now I do. <laughs> well, and that's what I, and then that's what I want. Like the first half was about you getting it, you learning about it. And then second half is the road to recovery and the road to recovery for yourself and for all patients who had COVID-19 who were, uh, and I say the lucky ones, and I, I hate to use that because there are, there, 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 there are people in the world who lost loved ones because of COVID, but you, you weren't, you, you survived is there a mental health aspect to the road to recovery? Because you, you, you are now the lucky one and you are seeing report after report of the increase because in July, numbers were increasing. It wasn't as bad as it got during until the fall, but numbers were increasing. How did, how did you get through that part? Because that's the part that I think a lot of people don't understand is people have died you were in the hospital, you were with the people that have passed away. How do you come out the other side and be the happy go lucky guy that you are right now, the bubbly guy that I'm talking to you right now, because I don't think I could have done it. Yeah, I didn't think I could do it either. The I've had a lot of help. Um, I'd say there's so many things to say that's been useful. The first thing that comes to mind is my two friends from football from high school. Uh, we had a, a dinner together. And it's funny, we were just talking about why we should have made the playoffs or <laughs> insulting, really just reminiscing about like still dissing certain people. And then it's like later in the night, I was just like, hey, I turned to my friend. I was just like, look, man, I can't take this anymore. I got to go. This is too painful. Um, and even though like even now I'm good there, especially back, this was back in November, uh, I would just I, I could not deal with being with people, maybe for an hour, but not longer than that. And he looked at me and says, man, I was in 9-11. Uh, I was a firefighter. I'm still struggling every, almost every day. He's in every day. And there are days I can't get out of bed. And this guy was so, so crazy knowing that he, that I wasn't alone and a good friend of mine. And then I was just like, geez, how many other people are suffering like this? And like not getting, not having that knowledge. So yeah, I'm passionate about sharing this. I had another friend who was also, he was in 9-11 too. And he was at the uh, Las, Las Vegas shootings. Um, and uh, he's, he's doing tons of uh, charity work for people, PTSD. He struggles for PTSD. And um, what people don't, so my version of PTSD is a little different. I don't have the classic symptoms of going back into the, uh, um, the experience because they shut my mind off. I wouldn't know if I did, <laughs> you know, it's like, so, so it's a little bit different, but the body knows. And when people struggle, uh, people go through traumatic, traumatic experience, uh, the, the, where the trauma is stored is not in the, in the mind where we're thinking rationally, it's stored somewhere, I forget where, but somewhere back there. Um, and to get there, we have to experience our body more. So 
how did I do this? I started seeing a somatic therapist, it's like body work therapist, uh, also a CBT therapist. Um, and I've just been able to also just, I've had to work with anxiety um, and figure out, wow, this is a new system. And I know I'm not the only one. People, after I wrote that book, constantly, constantly I'm getting uh, information from people like yo I'm, what's happening to me and I'm like that's anxiety man it's normal this is what's happening with and um I can speak to that and so this book for me is important because I'm trying to shed some light on that and ideally thank you for having me in the podcast to share this people are struggling and the other thing I try to do in my book is this to say thank you for everybody who helps people who don't um who are struggling whether it's with COVID or with cancer or with uh, any sort of debilitating uh, illness, you do so much more. We need you so much. <laughs> I've needed every single person who's helped me. And the ideally, there's heaven and you'll get rewarded. But if not, you should know <laughs> that like we, th what you do for us is precious. And um, I'm just grateful for the enormous community that came came up for me, both uh, the psychological community, friends. It's big. Because, and, and that's one reason you wrote this book and that you, you talk about it at the beginning of the book and then at the end during your, uh, uh, at my mind slipping with the word right now, but at the end of the book, you talk about why you wrote this book. You wrote this book as a love letter to not only your family who has stood by your side during this uh, horrible experience, but to the doctors, to the nurses, to the rehab uh, doctors and nurses who helped you on the road to recovery, to your friends who stood by you, who have stood by you after this. Um, when it when you got this finally done, you gave this, gave, I'm assuming you gave a copy to the people who helped you along the way, or you let them read it. What were their initial thoughts? Uh, well, a lot of people say, why didn't you write more? <laughs> Same thing you said. That's like I my, said that. <laughs> I said that. My number number one criticism uh, was that. And to me, that was the biggest compliment. And I, I try to remind them I'm not Mark Twain. And if I like, if I put like, you know, I don't, I, I anyway, I, I sort of, I heard that criticism and um, I sort of started a second version of the book and I realized, no, 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 no. It is what it is. It's good. Um, but the, uh, sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> the question is why the, the love story that you gave this when you when you officially got this book done and you gave it to your uh the the people who were involved your family members the doctors the nurses i'm assuming you let them read it what was their reaction because they're seeing it from their side of the story you're yeah. seeing it from your side of the story you sat down with all these people did they tell you hey you got it right you got yeah, all, exactly all the way that that i told you the I, way it happened I, is the way it is in the book yeah, it's funny. I've never thought about this before, but not one of them. I always gave people uh, an advanced copy to say, look, did I get this right? Not one of them asked me to change anything, um, except for my roommate who said, uh, hey, um, you, you got to put in the fact that I helped you a lot. I was like, oh, shit, sorry about that. Because <laughs> I made a joke about something she said about like, uh, and then, and she said, you're, you're forgetting the part where I like, you know, helped, <laughs> helped you live for a few months. I was like, oh yeah, let me, let me fix that. But other than that, I think uh, <laughs> I got it. I got it. And um, people felt the nurses were especially grateful for sharing what they do. Um, the doctors, I don't, I don't, they didn't have one reaction other they, they they enjoyed it um and my family they actually just said it was so painful they said they appreciated it but they they went through so much pain um it wasn't a joyous experience for them but they understand hey let's give people who haven't had this experience the book does a good job of, of sharing what it's like both for uh family members and uh and and, and, and a patient while I don't want to give too much away in the book, there's one part of the book that I I choked up about, and uh, I want to I want I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, it's when you're in rehab. It's the day you're getting released. Oh yeah, that was amazing. And and in the book, you say, "I don't want to go." <laughs> you're not sure if you're ready. Wait. How hard was it to actually take that first moment outside? And I, I see you're choking up and I do apologize if you don't want to talk about this. I'm okay with going on, but I, 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 I connect it with you. Not wanting to leave a hospital after being in medically induced in a coma, surrounded by people who are helping you is 
got to be the most tragic thing in your life because anyone else would want to get out of the hospital. Take me through that moment. I love that hospital so much, <laughs> you know, it, being a, a single divorced and um, uh, I just didn't know there was this beautiful care system that when you're at your worst, society's going to care for you. I didn't know. And having that quality attention, um, you know, for the most part, I did want to leave, just go home. But over time, it wasn't really leaving the hospital. It was facing my life that I just didn't want to leave. And when I, I, I had, before the disease, I kind of like stopped and thought I was giving up on life and thought, had a good life, so be it. Um, and then being in the hospital, all I really had to do was recover. Um, and I just had been able to walk for 10 feet. I could get out of the bed by myself. And the moment you're able to do those things, they want you to go home. Um, I, I wasn't ready, man. I wasn't ready for the world. And um, the harder part for me mentally was going home. It wasn't uh, in the hospital. Well, the first week coming out was was beyond. <laughs> that was something indescribable. Like, I can't even describe how bad it was. Uh, so, but after, after I had my like full consciousness, um, yeah, I would cry all day and, or a lot and experience. It was, it was tough, but nothing like coming home and reliving, um, life, not only in a world that had shut down. Well, in some ways it was good to shut down. Cause you know, I was like, well, I'm not missing any acrobatic shows. <laughs> my competition's like, you know, they're probably not training or maybe they are training, I don't know. but you know, it was, it was just painful. And then the worst part is when I did come home, just waking up was hard every day because you enter that dream world, you go back to that safe uh, place where everything is fine. And then you enter in the world and my ability to handle suffering was not quite there yet. And that's what I've been building up for this past year and um, not easy. You have been out of the hospital since June uh, the 30th of last year. Uh, we are literally coming up to the one year. We are recording this uh, on, I forget, I don't know the exact date right now because uh, June 21st, I knew that. So there you go, first full day of summer. Um, do you believe, and this is going to be a, might be a question that you might have to take a few some time. Do you believe you have a second lease on life now because of what oh, you've sure. gone through? There's, there, there's no... Um, it's funny. I would never, I don't wish this upon anybody. And I don't think this is the best way to have a, a big life change, but, um, this is absolutely been a beneficial, uh, the, the ability for me to say, you know what you do want to live. Um, and you know, if I, if I may share, there was a dream I had inside, um, one, my biggest spiritual revelations came to me in my second dream that, that I recall. And in it for forever, I've been an acrobatic dancer seeking the highest joy. I've, I've done a lot of things. I wasn't a Cirque du Soleil, but I was the level below that, you know. But I did want Cirque du Soleil, and I've been chasing for that highest level of, of, of achievement. And in the dream, I finally got it. And the moment I got it, this Indian spirit <laughs> coming from other countries, Indian spirit took this massive sword and cut me in half. Um, and it wasn't painful, but it was shocking. And in that shock, in that cutting in half, he was explaining to me that all of this longing for, for happiness is, is absolutely empty. And he revealed to me multiple worlds. And it might sound, uh, I don't know how it sounds, but I know for me, I ended my lifelong struggle of needing to do something to be happy. So this past year, the new year of life has been uh, just taking off those skins of, oh, I need to um, be married to be happy. I need to have a happy relationship to be happy. I need to uh, whatever, to write this book, to be happy and all that's bullshit. You can be happy as you're uh, doing anything. Um, and this one of many spiritual revelations, the ability to recognize all this time, I didn't realize I was connecting and helping so many people um, as being, being a teacher, being a dancer um, and how much significance I was placing on my own achievement instead of acknowledging my everyday interaction as being a source of happiness that for me is forever changed. And this past year has been my best year in a very, very long time. Looking forward, 
the people who are reading this book, what, what's the one thing you want to get, the one, you hope that they get out of this book? Because when an author sits down and writes a story, they can come up with different reasons why what they want people to get out of it. What are you hoping that people get out of it? Yeah, I think, <laughs> um, I can't say it's one thing. I'd say it's the, the perspective of two wolves, the perspective of we are much, uh, we're making a bigger difference and, uh, stepping out of a destination thinking and enjoying the process uh, that happiness is in our control in the moment. If we're not experiencing it, it's not about getting somewhere. It's about processing what your should or should not thoughts about the world are. And once you look at that, um, it's valuing mental health. It's valuing how you help uh, other people. Um, and it's uh, for all those people who said it, you know, there's still people who think that COVID is a hoax. I, my brother is a, te a teacher in my brother's school was telling her students that. And my brother's like, what? This, is, this is nuts. Um, am I, so for me, it's not one thing, um, but if there was one thing, it's the tale of two wolves that we're always um, being able to reshift re uh, what, what, what wolf we want to feed. Now, uh, to, to wrap this up, uh, I got to ask the question, where can people get the book? Because uh, that's why you're on the show. You're here to promote your book. And I, I highly recommend people go out and read the book. But where can they get the book, David? Yeah, you can get on Amazon. You can go to look up a COVID story. Um, you can check out davidparisbooks.com. And um, or you can email me if you want a free digital version. It's my pleasure to share. And you can share as many people as you'd like. Uh, I'm really out to share the message. Um, and yeah, you also, if you want to take a look at some other things, I wrote some other great books for kids. Um, great. Uh, my, and you can look, look up David Paris books on YouTube. My dance partner and I run a uh, dance company called Paradiso Dance, P-A-R-A-D-I-Z-O dance.com. You can check out a show that America's Got Talent. And I talked to the producer. I'm going, I, I think we're going on. We're not for sure, but we're trying out for the next season. And um, we're going to tell the COVID story recovery through an acrobatic uh, performance. And that's, um, that's that, look out for us next season where uh, we're, that's in the works. So uh, for my listeners and to my viewers, uh, the link to David's website, to the Amazon to purchase it, uh, and his email address will be uh, in the show notes. So I highly recommend you reach out, get a copy of this book, because like I said, it is an engaging uh, personal story that has character development throughout it. And while you might not know David personally, after this book, you you feel like you know him inside and out. So I highly recommend it. Uh, David, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. These The questions you asked were phenomenal. It pierced uh, new levels of new layers for me today. So I, I really appreciate that. And, and thank you so much.